when I took on just a little bit of background, why I chose this topic, when I um, first took on my job as agent here, I realized we had a lot of um, space. If you've ever been to the Kenton County Extension Office site, we have three and a half acres and it's, it's almost all lawn. And for me, I was like, this is a great opportunity to make an arboretum. So what we did was they had already had before I got there, they had started working on a tree trail. And um, in the two years I've been here, I think I've added about 100 different species in addition to what they had. So um, the what I had to do first, though, was come up and figure out what is native to our region. And so, um, you know, for a lot of people, when they hear native, it's such an ambiguous term. They don't really know what it means. Some people think, oh, that means like the state you live in. That means like the region of the country, but really uh, it really boils down to what is an eco region, which we're going to get into today. So the point of me talking to you today is about how to determine what plants are native to your eco region and figuring out what eco region you live in. So that's what we're going to be discussing. And then from there, once you know that you can then start to research and figure out what is native to that particular eco region and that is the basis of our arboretum so as of may this year we're officially uh we received arboretum status from arbnet which is an international body of arboreta that certifies arboretum so we we're really proud to achieve that and we believe we have 90 percent of all the native woody plants to our eco region at our three and a half acre site which we're really proud of so um, I'm going to talk to you about how I kind of figured out what those plants were. So the agenda, defining what a native is, determining um, where a plant is native to, resources to help you, and then plant material sources. So that's kind of what we're going to discuss a little bit. So when we're talking about native, we're really discussing about what plants were here prior to European se um, settlement. Um, we do have plants that are native to other parts of the United States that have naturalized, but a plant that has naturalized does not necessarily mean it's native. So plants like um, Osage Orange or um, the plant on the bottom left picture, that is naturalized, but that is actually a plant that is from uh, Central Texas and Arkansas area. Other plants have the same situation. We sometimes think of them as native because they've naturalized through spread of humans, but they essentially are not native. They're just as exotic as things from Asia. They're just a little bit maybe better behaved than some of our invasive species we have. But so we want to think about eco regions. We don't want to think about um, geopolitical lines, county, state, miles from where you live. Those are kind of arbitrary and that's not how nature works. You know, there's no real, we're looking at specific climatic conditions, factors of soil, pH, things like that, that will determine a plant's nativity and whether or not it can succeed and survive or thrive even in your particular area. And that is what determines whether a plant is native to your region or not. So when it comes to moving plants too, we can even think about this a little bit of a further step. This is sometimes when we're trying to talk about, all right, we want to source native plants. In, the, in an ideal world, we really want to source those seeds as close as possible to where we are located. And that is because um, there's ecotypes that play into it as a factor of seeds. So even though a plant might have a really broad range that falls through your area, it might be native to Quebec all the way down to Florida. And we know for a fact that the weather and climate, climate of those particular areas is very different to where we are here. So, um, a lot of native species have adapted locally to those conditions and they succeed better when you have plants that are um, up, that are progeny seeds from your local area. So um, we call that local provenance and ecotype. So it's a subset, subset of the species that has genetic adaptability to your local growing conditions. So some are much more um, variable and adapt much more easier over a broad range, but some native plants are not and they're much more um, they're much more restricted in their growth and success due to where they've evolved to grow. They might be very niche. And so that's something to think about when we're sourcing plants 
as much as we can where they where the seed came from not where it was grown in a nursery but where that seed source came from that was adapted to that particular eco region it came from so um, adaptations would be considered things such as soil chemistries um, minimum win winter temperatures drought tolerance ph um, soil type soil structure things like that so so for, as an example here, this is a range map of Acer rubrum, and you can see Acer rubrum stretches far up the eastern seaboard, well into North Canada, all the way down to almost South Florida and Minnesota and Texas. So huge range. But as we know, the hardiness zone where it's growing, the hardiness zones in mid South Florida are very different to Quebec. So we can bet that the seeds in red maples that have adapted to grow in Florida, there's a really good chance that those seeds, if they were planted, might not be able to survive in Quebec. So this is why knowing where your plants are coming from will give you a better idea of how likely they are to succeed. You know, a lot of times now we do genetic cuttings, which are things that are genetic clones. So we can kind of guarantee in a sense of what that plant's going to do and predict, especially if we know where it's from. But when we're growing things by sea, there's a tremendous amount of variability. So again, knowing the location of where it was from, very important. So as you can see here, uh, what I found out when I was doing research is that you really should not move a plant adapted to your ecoregion more than half a hardiness zone, if at all possible, to make it to make its chances for success as good as they can possibly be. So. Um, you know, in Kentucky, we have maybe two hardiness zones. So that gives us a good opportunity to say that most things from any part of the state would do pretty well. But with other places in the eastern U.S., that is not the same situation. So that's something to think about when you're moving seeds. Butterfly milkweed, um, Asclepius tuberosa, as we know, a very popular plant, happens to be one of the favorite plants for butterflies and other insects that we um, want to protect. So within the species itself, there are subspecies that have adapted to local provenances. So we have um, subspecies interior, we have tuberosa um, and others. So we really want to try, if at all possible, to get our seed sources or cuttings, at least, from plants that have adapted to our particular eco region. And so we would be better off with some of the ones that are kind of overlapping where Kentucky is. So words matter. Um, you know, it's really important to get the wording of what a native plant is, right? Because I think a lot of people, po politically, it, it's very powerful to call something invasive. And a lot of people are kind of working away from that term because of its connotations, perhaps. But when a plant is really aggressive, that does not mean it's invasive. It cannot be considered invasive, even if it's aggressive. It just means that if it's a native plant that's a that's aggressive, it's just aggressive, but it's not invasive. To be invasive means it has to, by default, be exotic and not from originating from your local area. So um, due to the fact that we have a lot of disturbance, um, forest fragmentation and farmland and sub subdivisions and building. We have incredible amounts of disturbance, meaning that plants that are naturally occurring here that thrive in disturbed environments, typically plants that are um, more ruderal in their habitat. So they produce a lot of seed, they grow quickly, they're short-lived, they often thrive and they're often considered weeds, but a lot of those plants are still native. So things like, um, Eastern red cedar, black locust, box elder, trumpet vine, campsis radicans, you know, those are aggressive and they can be, but certainly they aren't always, and they are native plants that do well here, but their ability to survive is enhanced due to the fact that we have so much disturbance on our highways and all different places. So again, being able to distinguish this when we're talking to the public can help us manage invasive species better invasive species better, as well as making sure they realize that there's a lot of natives that are good and that are still aggressive, but it doesn't mean um, we necessarily need to eradicate them. So this is a really cool map. And I don't know if you know, but there's a guy um, who's starting to put together this cool website. It's called the, Kent the Kentucky Native Plants Project. He started to categorize a lot of plants 
um, based on their particular ecoregion. And this is all based on the USDA's ecoregions maps, which I'm going to show you in a second. And this one's a little bit more um, easier to read, maybe, based on the visuals. So where I live, I'm considered to be in the outer bluegrass ecoregion. And that is a little bit different to the overall bluegrass ecoregion. But when I was trying to source plants for my site in Arboretum, I was looking at plants particularly for that were um, naturally growing within the inner and outer bluegrass ecoregions. So, and as you can see, we have quite a few ecoregions in Kentucky and not everything will adapt as well. A lot of things that would grow quite well in the Appalachian plateaus would not do well here where I live because of the fact that we have a very basic pH, a lot of limestone. And so people here who want to try to grow a lot of conifers, they typically struggle because of our uh, pH and soil type. Even though they're both native to Kentucky doesn't always mean, again, this is why eco, eco regions matter because they are hinting at a lot of what's going to succeed and do well in your region. So this is the USDA hardiness zone. This is a level four map. This is the most detailed map the USDA has out there. Um, this is a really wonderful tool. Highly would recommend you check it out. You can Google it. And so, um, like I said, where I live, we're in 71D and partly 71K, but we're still part of the outer bluegrass ecoregion. And so that's been helping me figure out what I can grow and grow well where I'm at. So I want to show you some really cool resources. So this is kind of ones I use to help me figure out what is native to where I live. And maybe you're familiar with some of these or not, but I just want to show you these anyway. So one thing I like, this is something I will use. Um, Wikipedia is pretty good as a source for this. When I'm looking at a particular species that may or may not be native to this part of Kentucky, what I'll often do is I'll put it in Wikipedia and then I'll start to scroll down and look at these maps. So that can be a really good indicator. So as you can see, uh, Kentucky, the yellow wood here, Cladasterus Kentuckia, not probably, probably closer to the inner bluegrass eco region. So it might not technically be in Kenton County, but it's probably still part of the eco region that would be appropriate for our site. So I included it at our site when we planted it. So that is one. Has anyone ever used the Autobahn website? So this is kind of cool. What you do is, I mean, this was designed for people who bird and are interested in birding, but what you do is um, you click on the website, you just type in native plants database, and you're going to be prompted to put in your email address and zip code. And then based on your zip code, it's just going to pull up um, based on your zip code, the native plants to your area. And I think this is a pretty good list. So you can look at the full results and it's going to bring up all the native plants that it thinks are native to where you are. And a lot of these are going to be um, herbaceous perennials, woody. So a lot of woodies, of course, um, vines, trees, shrubs, things like that. And they're going to talk about, you know, what it attracts. But for our case, we just want to see what populates as the list. So I often did look at this to get an idea of um, what plants would be native to my particular region. So that's another thing. My favorite resource is probably uh, BoneApp, the Biota of North America project. This is an old website, but it's really useful. So what you can do is you can quickly, um, there's different ways you can use this, but traditionally what I do is I click on where it says list plants by genera. And then you can think of any species that um, is native or um, not native or exotic. It doesn't matter. They have both. But if I click on like Amelanc here, which is um, service berry, we're going to see probably what they think it's related or uh, where it's native to. So we have here um, Amelanc arborea, and it's going to kind of break it down to the county. So the way it works is it has a key, which I'm going to show you what the colors mean. So here it kind of shows you the dark green means space, species is present in state and native, and the light green means it's present and not rare. So we're looking for the dark green to be native. 
But um, if we click on other things, like let's go to Lonisera. So we'll just check out um, Honeysuckle, which is Lonisera, if I can find it, L-O-N. There it is. So um, as we know, Lonisera, there's many different species. Um, Sempervirens is the one that's more native to our area, if you've ever grown it, the coral honeysuckle, really lovely. So here, um, based on this map, it might be native, but it's probably not very common. So it's much more common in the areas where it is in the light green. Now, I had imagined that this is probably naturalized in a lot of areas, but it might not have been originally found here. The other thing is cool is if you look at these maps, um, like Lanisera japonica or Mackii, that's um, the bush honeysuckle. So see how that's all in blue? That's going to tell you just based on the key of the light blue and the blue that it's exotic and it's present. So those are typically the ones that are often considered to be uh, invasive. So I'm just trying to think if there's any others um, that I wanted to show you. Here's another really cool thing. So if you Google Kentucky, you, University of Kentucky, and you type in tree list, you'll probably get this map, which is, or um, PDF, which is a list of, I think, what they consider to be all the native trees of Kentucky. Maybe, maybe not, but quite a few. And so they break them out onto ecoregion. And so when I was coming up with, again, what trees I needed, I was looking for the bluegrass ones. So every one that was an X on the bluegrass, I wanted to make sure I had that species. And as you can see, not everything is considered to be in the bluegrass. So we have, um, we do have downy service berry, but it is not considered to be, according to this, this list, native to our eco region, where it is, where else in the other regions of the state, it is considered to be native. So this is a really great tool that you can Google. And it kind of talks a little bit about, um, a little bit about what makes these regions unique and some of their geological features. So now if I go back to the PowerPoint, so that is what's native. Um, so that's what I pretty much use. I, based on those four websites, it's kind of how I would guess and check. So I would hear people tell me something and I'd be like, oh, I need to look it up. So I would try to go through these three, four websites and see if it was native to our eco region. So those are my tools. Now, what I found when I was trying to source a lot of these plants, especially some of the harder to find um, hickories, I really spent a lot of time researching efforts uh, for sourcing a lot of our natives. And believe it or not, a lot of our natives, it's very difficult to find locally. And I had to order a lot of them online through nurseries all over the country. So i um, happy to share ones that for me are pretty good, but one I will say is Woody Warehouse, if you've ever heard of it, probably the biggest selection of natives. They're based in Indianapolis. So twice I've gone and taken a van and filled up and the prices are really good, but that one's a really wonderful one. So I would highly recommend Woody Warehouse. Others, um, you know, of the State Forestry Division of Kentucky, they sometimes have some decent ones if you can get them before they sell out. The Boyer Farm has a... Um, a native plant sale in the fall and spring through the Cincinnati Zoo. There's also some uh, local nurseries that I haven't sourced a lot of things from personally because they didn't have the things that were really rare, which I needed. So for me, I was looking for really hard to find stuff. And this was kind of the list I came up with. So Tennessee Nursery, also a really good one based in Tennessee, but has a lot of our natives too. And they're bare roots. So they're pretty reasonably priced and they're small. So Pretty good if you're trying to do a lot of plants at a good price. Um, the KNPS, the Kentucky Native Plant Society, has a list of native plant nurseries that are local. And so that can be a good way to get an idea of what native plant nurseries are around. Other online ones are uh, Food Forest Nursery, Iron Weed Nursery, uh, the Tree Center, Great Plains Nursery, Possibility Place, things like that. So. Um, and that's pretty much it. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about in regards to native plants and how I go about figuring out for me where what plants are native to our eco region. And I think this is how I would 
tell somebody to go about doing it too. Cause it's kind of overwhelming. I think a lot of people want native plants, but I try to tell them that you have to know what that means first and realizing that there are boundaries for your um, geography that makes sense. You need to be aware of that first. And so, yeah.